a creepy old castle filled with ghosts, a mountain lodge where the restless spirits of lost climbers linger, and cursed Japanese gardens wait on this list of some of the most haunted places in Washington. Let's jump right in. Hey guys, and thanks for joining me on this list of some of the most haunted places in the Evergreen State of Washington. Recognized for its iconic Space Needle, for its abundant forest trails and breathtaking mountain vistas, and as the birthplace of Microsoft itself, Washington is also shrouded in spine-tingling ghost stories, native legends, and tales of the otherworldly. What lies in store on this list will shock you. Are you sure you're ready to begin? Our first haunt lands us in South Central Washington at the ever-popular Capitol Theater. The Capitol Theater, which is located in Yakima, Washington, is a popular venue boasting a 1,500-seat capacity that serves as the primary facility for performing arts through the region, and that's surrounded by a slew of chilling ghost stories and tales of inexplicable phenomena. Historically, this theater site was initially designed under B. Marcus Proteca and would open its doors over 100 years ago on April 5th of 1920 as the Mercy Theater, a moniker which was derived from its owner, theater magnate Frederick Mercy Sr. Impressively, at the time of its grand opening, the Mercy Theater, which featured vaudeville acts, was actually the largest theater in the whole of the Pacific Northwest. In 1972, the Allied Arts Council alongside the city of Yakima would work together to start the process of transferring the site to public ownership. On April 11th of 1973, the theater was listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and over time, ownership would be transferred to the city. Sadly, on August 11th of 1974, a large fire would heavily damage the structure, leaving only the stage house unscathed. However, on the upside, the theater's iconic Steinway Grand Piano, which was actually signed by former president of Steinway & Sons, Henry E. Steinway, would survive the blaze. Over the following years, the Capitol would undergo extensive and highly expensive renovations, would be restored to its original 1920 state, and would welcome the addition of a basement with restrooms and a meeting space. Notably, during this period, esteemed artist Anthony Heinsbergen, who painted the theater's original ceiling murals as his first paid project, would actually come out of retirement just to repaint the dome. And on November 4th of 1978, the property would be declared under Governor Dixie Lee Ray and would host a grand reopening ceremony featuring Bob Hope, which would sell out entirely. In the present, the Capitol Theater remains open and acts as home to the Yakima Symphony Orchestra, the Town Hall Series, and community concerts, while also lending its space out to various traveling Broadway musicals and other events. Frighteningly, the Capitol Theater is believed to house more than just good entertainment, and long-standing local legends tell its bounds are home to several ghostly patrons, with both staff and guests reporting extreme cold patches, disembodied footsteps heard from empty spaces, and encounters with both shadowy figures and the full-bodied apparitions of former theatergoers and performers alike. Several have told of hearing applause when the building is completely empty, and old-timey music is often heard drifting through the air. Easily the most famous ghost story tied to the Capitol tells of a former stagehand dubbed Shorty, who, in life, fell in love with an actress. When this actress rejected Shorty, it said that he fell into a deep depression, resulting in him taking his own life right on the catwalk, and in his restless spirit lingering. The ghost of Shorty is often described as mischievous, albeit friendly, and has been known to lock and unlock doors, flush toilets and turn on sinks, and hide important papers from management. Okay, so our second haunt has us hiking up the slopes of the iconic Mount Rainier to the Paradise Inn. The Paradise Inn, which is located in an area also called Paradise that's placed on the slopes of Mount Rainier in Washington, is a rustic, lodge-like hotel situated near the Henry M. Jackson Visitor Center and the 1920 Paradise Guidehouse, where many ascending the mountains start their climb, and over the years has been associated with a number of chilling ghost stories and haunting local legends. 
Historically, in 1915, this inn was initially designed under Frederick Heath and his company Heath, Gove & Bell, and was plotted out of Longmire. However, following its original financier, John Reese's decision to back out of the project, the National Park Service would select Paradise as a building site instead. The project would be overseen by the Rainier National Park Company, with the process utilizing native cedar, rock, and weathered timber salvaged from an earlier 1885 fire. The structure itself was finished by 1916, and on July 1st of 1917, the lodging would officially open its doors. In 1920, a four-story annex was added. In 1931, a golf course was designed on site by Roy H. Doble. In 1936, a ski rope tow was installed, and from 1942 to 43, the property would be utilized in the housing of army troops undergoing winter mountain training. Sadly, over the years, the mountain's unrelenting weather conditions would begin taking their toll on the inn. In 1952, the Rainier National Park Company would sell the property to the National Park Service, and while, for a time, the structure was considered for demolition, in 1979, $1.75 million were spent to restore and reinforce the building, after which, in 1987, it was declared a National Historic Landmark. The Paradise Inn remains open into the present, offering 121 rooms, a full-service dining room, a gift shop, its own post office, a cafe, and acts as a starting point to a number of scenic trails and mountain vistas. The most famous legend surrounding the Paradise Inn claims its bounds and surroundings are haunted by the restless spirits of those who died climbing Rainier, and both staff and guests over the years have reported a host of supernatural phenomena, including phantom footsteps heard through empty halls, instances of furniture moving around on its own, and ghostly whispers that float on the winds in the middle of the night. One more prominent account comes from an on-site baker who documented walking the inn alone when someone or something unseen whistled right behind them. Notably, with the exceptions of the site's security guard and the baker's own daughter who was working the front desk at the time, the area was completely empty, and when the baker brought what they'd experienced up to the ladder, their daughter informed them that it was common knowledge the inn was known to accommodate more permanent guests. Lastly, a number of individuals staying overnight have reported lights or faucets within their quarters turning on and off by themselves, instances of their clothing being found either packed up or unpacked inexplicably, and one harrowing account in which a guest was awakened in the middle of the night to a ghostly woman standing in the corner of their room and staring at them for a few moments before fading right through the wall. Our third haunt takes us to Washington's largest metro, to the Kubota Gardens. The Kubota Gardens, which is located in the Rainier Beach neighborhood of Seattle, Washington, is a 20-acre public expanse containing a wide variety of exotic flora that, through its existence, has held ties to a range of purported hauntings and accounts of paranormal activity. Historically, in 1907, one Fujitaro Kubota would immigrate to Seattle from Shikoku, Japan, and in 1923 would establish the Kubota Gardening Company, after which he would rapidly pick up steam, completing projects at Seattle University and across the Bloedel Reserve on Bainbridge Island. Following his growing success, in 1927, Fujitaro would purchase five acres of swampland off of Rainier Beach. In 1930, he would procure more land and would increase the size of his plot to around 30 acres. And while his lands would initially act as a center for his nursery business, they would simultaneously grow to be recognized as a center for Japanese culture right within the U.S. Through World War II, sadly, Kubota and his family would be interned at Camp Minidoka in Idaho, while his gardens were left abandoned for four years. However, following the war, he and his sons would return to Seattle, where they would rebuild their business. And in 1972, Fujitaro would be awarded the Fifth Class Order of the Sacred Treasure under the Japanese government, in recognition for him introducing and popularizing Japanese gardening techniques in his adopted country. Notably, Fujitaro would maintain these gardens until his passing in 1973. In 1981, the garden's core would be declared a historical landmark under the Seattle Landmarks Preservation Board. In 1987, the city of Seattle would purchase the garden, which has been maintained by the Department of Parks and Rec in partnership with the Kubota Garden Foundation. In 1999 and the year 2000, respectively, the Tom Kubota Stroll Garden was established and would open to the public. And in 2004, a new entrance gate designed under Gerard Sudakawa would be constructed. More recently, in 2020, a book called Spirited Stone, Lessons from Kubota's Garden was released to honor Fujitaro's legacy. And for those of you interested in more philosophical reads, we highly recommend giving it a look. 
While for many, the Kubota Garden is a place of peace and reflection, the site has also long been considered one of Seattle's most haunted locations, and those visiting the area, especially after dark, have reported disembodied footsteps that cut through dense brush, instances of well-maintenanced vehicles refusing to start, and strange puffs of phantom smoke that float about with seeming sentience. One more popular story tells that near one of the garden's bridges, an otherworldly moaning or shrieking can be heard. This unearthly sound has been detected by many up into the present, and several have even managed to catch the phenomenon in recordings. Easily the most famous local legend surrounding the Kubota Gardens tells that in a small house on site and long ago, there lived a family. One night, the father of this family became possessed and killed both his wife and 17-year-old daughter before taking his own life. Now, many Seattle kids claim that if one visits the house on their 17th birthday and knocks on its door, whatever murderous demon lurks there will follow them, and they'll only have a week to live before it exacts its curse. Now, whether this story holds any validation is really up for debate. However, one high-profile account tells of kids who went to the house to test the legend and threw rocks at the structure only to have something from within knock back with every stone that hit. Eventually, they got closer and knocked three times on the door, to which, and horrifyingly, there were three knocks in response from within, sending them running in terror from the property. And on to number four, which has us straddling the Oregon-Washington border at Fort Vancouver. Fort Vancouver, which is located just out of Vancouver, Washington, off the northern banks of the Columbia, is a 19th century fur trading outpost and defense that once acted as headquarters to the Hudson's Bay Company's Columbia Department, and that's easily recognized as one of the most haunted places in the state. Historically, during the onset of the War of 1812, rival fur trading outfits the Canadian Northwest Company and the American Pacific Fur Company would operate through the Pacific Northwest. However, following news of encroaching British forces, the PFC would decide to transfer all of its assets to the NWC, and upon the arrival of the HMS Raccoon, Fort Astoria would be renamed as Fort George, in honor of King George III of the United Kingdom. By 1818, skirmishes between the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company would result in the Pemmican War, and by conflict's end, in 1821, the British government would order the NWC to merge into the Hudson's Bay Company, after which, through the remainder of the decade, overseer of the new Columbia District, Sir George Simpson, would devise the need for a more suitable headquarters inland, and would select a location situated opposite from the mouth of the Willamette. In 1824, Fort Vancouver had been established, and by 1843, it would boast a total of 24 buildings, including houses, where warehouses, a school, a library, a pharmacy, a chapel, a blacksmith, and a large manufacturing facility, all enclosed within a 250-yard palisade wall that would reach 20 feet in height. On some interesting side notes, Fort Vancouver would play home to more than 25 tribes native to the Americas, including the Cowlitz and Metis, whose lands it was actually constructed on. And from the 1840s and onward, it would sport the largest population of native Hawaiians outside of the Hawaiian Islands themselves, many who were fresh off the boat. The Oregon Treaty of 1846 would set the border between the U.S. and Canada at the 49th parallel, landing the fort within U.S. bounds. In 1849, the U.S. Army would establish its Vancouver barracks just adjacent to the fort. For a time through the 1850s, the barracks and the fort would coexist while weathering several conflicts. In 1860, the company would abandon the fort entirely in favor of operating out of British Columbia instead. And sadly, in 1866, the original Fort Vancouver would burn to the ground in a fire after which its ruins would be buried by both time and the elements. In 1947, the National Park Service would contract archaeologist Lewis K. Wood to excavate remnants of the original fort. On June 19th of 1948, Fort Vancouver was declared a U.S. National Monument. On June 30th of 1961, it was redesigned as the Fort Vancouver National Historic Site, and reconstruction of the defense's original structures was started through the 1970s. The Fort Vancouver National Historic Site remains open into the present, serving as a valuable educational landmark to the Pacific Northwest as a whole, and accommodates all manner of tour groups, field trips, events, and more. Not really all that surprisingly, over its lengthy lifespan, Fort Vancouver has earned a reputation as one of the more haunted places across the whole of the state of Washington, with both staff and visitors reporting a wide array of supernatural activity, including instances of objects or artifacts moving on their own, extreme cold spots felt in adverse weather, and run-ins with both shadowy figures and various full-bodied apparitions in garb spanning the centuries and even back to traditional native attire. 
Easily one of the site's most famous haunts is that of its prominent Grant House, which sits off of Officer's Row. Through the 1850s, this prestigious residence would play home to none other than future Civil War General and U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant. Over the years, it would welcome numerous expansions and upgrades, and today, it holds the willful wine bar where guests can sip back some savory vino right off the banks of the Columbia. Chillingly, the whole of this aged premises is rumored to hold a ghost named Sully, and those who have spent time within have reported the sensation of someone unseen walking past them, disembodied bootsteps heard from empty spaces and the constant feeling that Sully is always watching or overseeing the property's business dealings. Additionally, within other houses across Officer's Row, many have told of doors opening and closing on their own, of phantom voices heard on the winds, of ethereal forms that appear in mirrors and other reflective surfaces, and of the smells of cologne, perfume, tobacco smoke, or food without source. Lastly, in Building 614, or formerly the Vancouver Barracks Hospital, the front door has a habit of opening on its own even while locked, and in its basement, which was formerly a morgue, some have reported encounters with an aggressive apparition. And across the whole of the historic fort site, phones that are unplugged have been known to ring, the ghostly sounds of musket fire have been heard, and several have reported playing witness to intense visions of the past that are always gone in the blink of an eye. Last but not least, our fifth and final haunt takes us just southwest of Tacoma to the ever-legendary Thornwood Castle. Thornwood, or Thornwood Castle, which is located out of Lakewood, Washington, is a massive 50-plus room estate that spans over 27,000 square feet, complete with awe-inspiring gardens that, over the years, has fell into its role as one of the state's most haunted mansions. Historically, in 1890, New York tycoon Chester Thorne, who was accompanied by his wife Anna, would move to the Tacoma area to become the founder of the Port of Tacoma and later the president of the Bank of Tacoma. Shortly after their move, in 1895, the couple would welcome a daughter, Anita, into the world, and seeking to create what he considered a grand country seat in the region, Chester would set to work on the planning of a massive castle. Construction of Thornwood would commence in 1909, during which time, Mr. Thorne would import materials from a demolished 15th century English palace for the creation of his estate, with over 500-year-old bricks utilized throughout the property and across the gardens. And by 1911, his not-so-humble abode would open its doors. Following Thornwood's construction, Chester's new home would require the hiring of 40 servants and 28 full-time gardeners to dote upon his family. And over the following decade, the Thorns would live a lavish life within their new palace. Sadly, on October 16th of 1927, Chester would meet his fate, after which Anna was left in control of his assets and of their prized family home, and would continue to run his various business dealings and community efforts. Anita, who was fully grown by then, who had married one Cadwallader Chorus, and who had bore a son, would live alongside her mother in the large manor. However, the couple would eventually divorce, following which Anita would remarry to one Major General David C. Stone. Unfortunately, Stone would be transferred to the Panama Canal Zone and would move he and his new family away, leaving Anna alone within the sprawling estate. Notably, she would document that the grounds felt empty without her family and would end up moving to a smaller home she'd had constructed off of North 5th Avenue and D Street, where she would remain until her daughter, grandson, and son-in-law had returned, after which she too would return to Thornwood before peacefully passing on in 1954. Following the subsequent death of General Stone in 1954, Anita would sell Thornwood to one Harold St. John, who would subdivide the attached land into 30 home sites while reserving a whole 4 acres and around 110 feet of lakefront for the mansion itself. And over the decades, the castle would change hands a number of times before it was eventually purchased in the year 2000 by Wayne and Deanna Robinson, who would set to work on necessary renovations and upkeep while faithfully upholding its legacy. Notably, the same year, the expansive estate was also utilized in the filming of Stephen King's miniseries Rose Red, which followed a group of psychics sent to investigate a haunted mansion, which in turn held a number of restless spirits and had a bad habit of changing on and murdering its visitors. 
In the present, Thornwood remains in the hands of the Robinsons and remains open to the public as a bed and breakfast while acting as a vacation, wedding, and event venue. Chillingly, the whole of Castle Grounds are believed to host a slew of very real ghostly presences, with owners, staff, and guests reporting a wide range of inexplicable phenomena, including extreme cold patches, furniture found rearranged overnight, and a strange, unidentifiable goop discovered on various surfaces that's suspected to be ectoplasm. A more disturbing supernatural happening documented at Thornwood involves the lake and the suspected ghost of a past owner's grandson. As it's been described many times from eyewitnesses, a little boy is commonly sighted splashing around frantically in the waters, screaming for help, resulting in those who spot him rushing to the shore's edge to offer assistance, only to watch as the figure vanishes in front of their eyes, leaving the waters calm and quiet. Also reported throughout the Grand Estate are instances of objects sighted moving on their own, including lamp arms and chandeliers swinging wildly, encounters with a ghostly gentleman in leather and with a woman clad in an empire-styled dress on the main stair, and accounts of light bulbs found either turned off or unscrewed entirely. One more famous tale describes an incident experienced by the Robinsons shortly after their purchase of the property. As it's told, Deanna was relaxing in the Great Hall and reading a book when the room around her was suddenly filled with the sounds of a noisy cocktail party, complete with glasses clinking, chatter, and disembodied footsteps. Overcome with the strong feeling she'd intruded on something or that her living presence had disturbed the spirits here, Deanna proclaimed loudly, Okay, you guys have fun. I'm going away now, and immediately left the area. Additionally, Deanna also later described sighting what appeared to be a vortex in the very same hall, and even witnessed several figures crossing through it. Much like its on-screen counterpart, Rose Red, several have described instances of rooms or hallways within Thornwood completely changing on them, or the discovering of new rooms or hallways that they are never able to relocate again. Incidentally, during the filming of the Stephen King horror series, cast and crew members also documented a host of supernatural happenings, including equipment malfunctions or complete power outages, accounts of tools going missing only to reappear later all the way across the house, and doors opening and closing on their own. Lastly, across Castle Grounds, the spirits of both Chester and Anna Thorne have been sighted, at times together and at others separately, with Chester's apparition most often found in his study or pacing various hallways, and Anna's ghost either found in her former bedroom gazing out over the gardens, or spied in its mirror, or other reflective surfaces across the property. Thornwood Castle stands as a testament to the grandeur of a bygone era, its storied history interwoven with tales of opulence, tragedy, and of the unexplained. From its origins as a visionary creation of Chester Thorne in the early 20th century to its modern-day role as a charming bed and breakfast, this odd demence has endured the passage of time, changing hands while managing to retain its mystique. Yet beneath its elegant facade lies a realm where the supernatural seems to hold sway, with reports of ghostly apparitions, inexplicable phenomena, and eerie encounters abound. Whether it's the spectral cries of the drowning child on the lake's edge or the unsettling sights of objects moving on their own accord, this estate continues to captivate and intrigue visitors with its haunting legacy. As the Robinsons faithfully preserve its heritage, one can't help but wonder what other secrets lie hidden within its walls, just waiting to be uncovered by those brave enough to explore its bounds. Thanks for joining me in this exploration of some of Washington's most haunted places. If you enjoyed hearing my histories and ghost stories, subscribe to my channel, like this upload, and share me with anyone you feel could use a good scare. I'll catch you all next time.